So, dear friends, I'm greeting you once again uh, from our church here uh, in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, uh, on this beautiful day when we're heading into the latter half of the month of September, uh, where the summer heat has let up a little bit, but uh, yet we haven't had to face the, the bleak chill of winter quite yet. Uh, we're also coming to you with really the greatest treasure that we possibly could offer, and that would be the words and promises of God. But the only other ingredient that we need uh, our willing listeners, uh, and that's where we uh, are so grateful uh, that you've tuned in and are going to uh, participate uh, by means of the internet uh, in this service that we bring into your home this day. Uh, we ask God to pour out his blessing both upon us uh, who have prepared this worship uh, and you who will be on the listening end and ask him to bring forth from it the fruits of faith and love that please him. For Jesus' sake we ask it all. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. We bow our heads to pray. O oh Lord, we beg of you, let your continual pity cleanse and defend your church, and because she cannot continue in safety without your aid, preserve her evermore by your help and goodness, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The epistle for this now, which is the 15th Sunday after Trinity, is from Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapters 5 and 6. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the sixth chapter. And the words of this Gospel also serve as the basis for the preaching today. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. 
But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, now we're going to confess our holy faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The appointed hymn uh, from our hymnal is number 725, though we, like always, are going to project the words on the screen for you, Children of the Heavenly Father. May God give to every one of you people much grace and peace in the knowledge of him and of his Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. As we mentioned before, we're going to focus today on the gospel words uh, from that reading uh, from Matthew chapter 6. I want to repeat just the final two verses of that Matthew 6, where Jesus says, Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now let's pray. 
Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. Amen. In Christ, who is our comfort, my beloved brothers and sisters, nobody avoids at least some worries. The big question is knowing how to manage them. Managing them is something like being able to control your language or being thankful. All those things, whether it's worry or controlling your language or being thankful, go to show what you really think about God. If you try to put God on equal footing with every other concern in life, or let's put it this way, if you let him be just one interest among many, many others, then you're going to be pretty much captive to worry for the simple reason that you are not going to have any defense against it. On the other hand, when you cling to him instead as your ultimate and your only Lord, you'll be able to cope with worry. That's also true even if you're one of those people who struggles with worry, let's say, more than the average person does. Jesus meets you in today's Gospel reading. He is not coming mostly to condemn you or even to lecture you about your failures in this area of life. Jesus comes instead to lift the load off your shoulders. He comes to release you and comes very mercifully to give you permission not to worry. And on the basis of these gospel words that were read to you just a few minutes ago, I'd like to uncover about three things uh, for you to think about now. The first is the truth about what worry really is as far as the Lord is concerned. The second is how God opens your eyes to see certain things about worry. And the third thing is how Jesus empowers you to leave worry behind. Jesus was describing very, very basic things like food and clothing when he said the pagans, in other words, he means people who don't really live uh, with God, they run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. After all, God himself gave you a body that needs to be fed and needs to be covered and there is absolutely no sin in trying to make arrangements to have those things for yourself and the people, let's say, that you provide for in your household. But there comes a point where we're not satisfied to ask God's help to meet the legitimate needs of body and life, a point where people get fevered, you might say, and actually driven for the things that money can buy. When Jesus says that godless people run after these things, he doesn't mean that somehow you and I are better people than all of them who don't believe in him, but because tens and millions of women don't have him sitting as Lord on the throne of their lives, if I could put it in those terms, they don't let that throne sit empty. It's tempting to place on that throne instead the things that money buys with this constant preoccupation of getting and retaining and amassing more things. In advanced countries like our Canada, the temptation is there to lose sight of the real difference between what you really need and the things that you just kind of would like to have, and somehow to buy into the notion that you sort of need absolutely everything that you happen to want, to the point where you can be kind of disgruntled and ungrateful unless you get it. The Lord is not against your prudent planning, and he's not against the honest work that you might do to meet those needs. There were church members, the New Testament tells about it, among the Thessalonians who were so hepped up on the second coming of Christ that they sort of quit their jobs and gave up providing for themselves and their families. They thought somehow that faith and the pious life means that you just sort of sit around with your hands in your lap and you don't concern yourself with the needs of body and life. You know, the Apostle St. Paul had some very blunt guidance about how to deal with that kind of laziness. He said, if a man refuses to work, let him not eat. At some point, however, legitimate concern about making a living 
crosses the line and it becomes worry, sort of a hyper preoccupation with the stuff that you can buy. In Psalm 86, King David taught us to pray to God, give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. You see, in the Bible's language, that's really what the word worry means. It's about having a divided heart where you give a slice of it to this and a slice of it to that, where your love for God and your love for the things that you can buy end up like slices competing against each other and where you're actually tempted just to give the Lord a little slice. Jesus was quite clear at the start of today's gospel. Nobody can serve two masters like that. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Let worry have its way with you, and Jesus says that you're trying to do something that simply cannot be done. You're trying to give a piece of yourself to different masters. Back in the time of the New Testament in the Roman Empire, where many people were being bought and sold as slaves, let's say Master John buys a slave from Master Joe. Well, let me tell you something. At that point, Master John expects that slave to be 100% his. If that slave thinks in the future that he can float between the two of them, the truth is that Master John is not going to put up with that. Let worry have its way with you and your preoccupation of stuff will behave exactly like Master John, if you know what I'm saying. It won't stand for that. I don't think I could say it any more clearly than this. Let worry have its way with you, and you're in the process of turning away from the Lord. No one can serve two masters. You don't have to believe me, because I didn't say that. Jesus said it. You see, worry really, in the end, boils down to what I want to call a First Commandment problem. Those of you who were instructed in the faith years ago may remember learning the Holy First Commandment, you shall have no other gods, and maybe those of you who have a really sharp memory recall learning also the meaning of that commandment from our catechism, where it said we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. That does not have to crowd out other people or concern for other things. It does mean that your ultimate fear and love and trust belong to the Lord. Jesus, in this gospel that we have in front of us today, shows you, you have very good reason to fear and love and trust in God above all things. He tries here to open your eyes to some of the truth about worry. Look at the birds of the air, he said. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I've watched birds out the back window. I can report to you that up to now I have never seen a single one of them lying awake at night fretting about how he was going to eat the next day. To be sure, when the day dawned, the bird didn't just sit there. You know, he got out there and looked for food. Somehow, God managed to feed that bird in spite of the fact that it didn't, you know, lie up uh, all night worrying about food. Or look at your own body. The Lord wove you together and cared for you through those very special nine months when you were growing in that hidden place already in the body of your mother. He gave you a body with circulating blood and with air, or, or lungs rather, that know how to process the air, and eyes to see and a mind to grasp what they were looking at. Could it really be that the God who gave you that first-class gift, your body, would deny you the accessories, if I could call it that, in other words, food and clothing, to meet that body's needs? That's impossible, Jesus says. And here's why. Are you not much more valuable than the, words God, the birds rather that God feeds? And don't you matter more to him than the field flowers that he dresses up in such a pretty way outside. Jesus asks that question. He doesn't immediately answer it. That's because he wants you and me to answer it. Of course you mean more to God than birds and flowers do. Psalm 8 sings, Lord, you made man a little bit lower than the heavenly beings and have crowned him with glory and honor. Human beings were made by God to be the very crown of creation. 
If he takes care of birds for a brief time, and flowers, let's say, that last only a single summer, do you really doubt that he's going to be dedicated to taking care of you? Besides that, Jesus asks, I'm going to call it a prosecutorial question about your worries and mine. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Can your worries make you taller than you are? Can worrying make you live 10 years longer than you otherwise would? I mean, maybe there might be health measures that you would implement to make your body stronger, but I can tell you right off the bat, worrying is not one of those. To say it another way, worrying is a dead end and gets you nowhere. I would be surprised if it stung a little bit in the ears of Jesus' hearers that day when he said, O oh, you of little faith. It may still sting because you may feel, as I do, that he'd have a good reason to say that to us too, O oh, you of little faith. Jesus does not say this because he is out to wound you. He doesn't say it because he's saying that, well, if you struggle with worry, that proves, you know, hands down that you have no faith. If he calls you someone of little faith, he does that because he's really out there trying to help your faith grow. He yearns to make you stronger. And he doesn't just sort of slam you on the head, you know, with an order, grow up, you of little faith. Instead, in very forgiving love, he tells you how it can happen. And he invites you in mercy to leave worry behind like this. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, in other words, all that stuff you're tempted to fret about, will be given to you as well. What does it mean to seek God's kingdom? Well, it means to be concerned with how the Lord is trying to rule in the world and what he's trying to do in your personal life. It means paying close attention to what this king wants from you and what this king wants for you. He wants your love, dear friend. And since you and I have not always given him our love, he's also yearning for your repentance and your confession and your sorrow for all the ways that you tried to make yourself or make your worries into the king. He's eager to have your heart reach up to him almost the way a toddler does. You've seen it, you know, with these little tiny hands when they stretch out to mom or dad in the hope that that merciful parent will pick them up. Seek for his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, forget all about your righteousness and all the things that you think that you have done to make yourself an okay person as if you somehow deserve what he would give. You'll come up short if you think that way, but seek his righteousness. Jesus was talking about himself when he said that. It's because Jesus himself is the one who came down into our world and led the righteous life that you and I so often have failed to lead. It's because Jesus died and covered over your failures with holy blood so that his righteousness comes to you as an undeserved gift as you do this little thing with your hands, you know, and reach out and cling to him with the trust of a little child. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be given to you as well. The one who gave his life to save your life knows very well about all the details of your needs. To tell you the truth, he knows the details of your needs better than you do. He hears the prayers that you speak when you ask his help with the needs of your body and life. And Jesus doesn't even mean the words, do not worry, to be some sort of a harsh command. No, instead he permits you to give your trust to him. He gives you permission, gracious permission, to leave worry behind. Cast all your cares on him, the Bible says, because he cares for you. This can free you up for what you have in front of you today and also what's coming your way tomorrow. The Lord will be there to help with the burdens and demands that present themselves tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. So you go ahead and do your sensible planning. And as each day dawns, 
you go ahead and work as faithfully as you can in the calling that God has given to you, in your position as a wife or a husband, as a mother or a father, as a teacher or a student, as a manager or an employer or whatever it is. Christ never tells you that the pious life is to just sort of sit around, you know, and sing kumbaya and not do anything. But he invites you to trust him because he has proven that he cares when he went to his cross. And he permits you now in love to leave worry behind. You see, Jesus says, tomorrow's possible troubles don't have to enslave you already today. After all, you should know by now from experience that some of tomorrow's troubles are never going to materialize. Others will come, and by that time, God will make clear to you how you ought to handle those things. You have more than enough to keep yourself busy for the day that you've got right in front of you now. Seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. That's about holding the Lord's name and his promises very high in front of your eyes. That name and those promises are always there, of course, but at times you let worry and preoccupation sort of turn you blind so that you can't see that those things are there. In the services of God's house, like this little service that we're attempting to bring you today, we also hold up the Lord's name and his promises before you so that you'll see them for what they are and will actually be attracted and drawn to this Christ who invites you to trust him. This, by the way, is also a very compelling reason to organize a devotional life for yourself at your home, where you focus daily on at least a little bit of God's words and promises to you, and spend at least a little bit of time in your prayers, thanking him for what he has done, and setting the needs of this new day before him all over again. Christ gives himself to you in all these ways so that worry, widespread as it might be, doesn't slice up your heart so that you try to give God just a little peace and so that he, the everlasting king, may rule over you in his mercy and as a king hold you close and in union with Christ his righteousness. Well, that's how to manage worry if you ask Jesus. And he'll gladly help you with that time and again. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you now to join me in praying to the Lord. Almighty and eternal God, you are worthy to be held in reverence by people everywhere. And we give you humble and sincere thanks for the countless blessings that you have bestowed on us without any merit or worthiness on our part. We praise you most of all for preserving for us your saving word in the holy sacraments. Grant and preserve to your church all over the world purity in teaching, and provide faithful pastors to preach that word with power. Help all who hear your word rightly to understand and sincerely to believe it. Send laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith far and wide to those who do not know you. In mercy, bring to repentance the enemies of your people and grant them amendment of life. Protect and defend your church in all its tribulations and dangers. Strengthen us and all our fellow Christians to set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ and help us to fight the good fight of faith that in the end we receive the salvation of our souls. We ask you to bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially our country, Canada, its inhabitants, and all who have authority here. Let your glory dwell in our land that mercy and truth Righteousness and peace may abound in all places. We commend to you the care of our First Lutheran Christian Academy, our beloved school, so that our children may grow in useful knowledge and Christian virtue and bring forth wholesome fruits of life. 
we ask you to accept our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings that we ever bring before you as our humble service. And since we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, Help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world yet to come, doing the work that you have given us to do while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. And when our last hour comes, support us by your power and receive us into your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is this the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The next hymn is number 760 in our hymnals for those of you who have one at home. And we're going to sing the first four of its verses, What God Ordains is Always Good.
the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.